So hello. Uh, so, and I hope you enjoyed the uh, previous talk and also the sponsor videos. And uh, next, we will have another very interesting talk that is by uh, Dr. Christoph uh, Zimmerman. So uh, let's welcome him on stage. <laughs> Just be with you in a minute. Sorry. Oh, yeah, some technical difficulties, I guess. Uh, that's fine. Uh, so, yeah, and uh, what do you like most about EuroPython, actually? Um, so it's the second year that we do this online. And um, so this year we're trying to use a lot of different tools. We have Matrix and also we have WonderMe uh, for the hallway. So make sure uh, you go check that out because uh, yesterday in the Lightning talk, we play a little bit uh, with WonderMe and people were chasing each other. It was super fun. So, uh, yeah, go there and uh, meet other conference goers. And uh, of course, if you have questions for any of the speaker, you can post in the um, the, the, the speaking, you know, uh, the, 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 the chat in Matrix. So um, yeah, so I think, uh, yes, <laughs> welcome back. <laughs> so um, hello. Be, yeah, be with me. I just have to get this thing up and running. And here we go. I hope everybody can see me at my screen. Yes, I think uh, we can see your screen at the backstage. And when you're ready, uh, our technician will put that on stage. So don't worry Perfect. about that. Excellent. Yes. I thought I was live already. Sorry about this. <laughs> That's OK. So uh, where are you calling from? Uh, Frankfurt. Frankfurt. Oh, wow. Uh, I always want to go, but I, I missed the chance to go, I think, because, uh, okay. yeah, you know, uh, all the uh, travel was canceled <laughs> due to Fair COVID. Enough. Yeah, but uh, I'm sure that I would, uh, would go uh, when I have a chance. Excellent. So. Yes. Uh, when so yeah, I can see that you are sharing this screen. Uh, yes. Yeah, and if you can go to your slides and then uh, we can start. Absolutely. Here we go. Here we go. Take us away. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for uh, taking the time and attending my talk. Today, I'm going to talk about something called Redis and Redis Gears, um, which is an essentially a NoSQL. Uh, database, an extendable no, a multimodal NoSQL database, and hence the title of the presentation, Adventures in Real Time, Python NoSQL Star. But first of all, who am I? I'm a techie through and through. I did my PhD on reflective operating system architecture about 35 years ago, and this is actually, that was the point in time when I discovered a an operating system called Linux, which has been with me for that amount of time ever since. Um, I started um, with Linux when the kernel was still at 0.95 in the overall um, history of Linux. And um, as I said, Linux is, has, been, has been with me for the last uh, almost 30 years now. I'm also the tech support at a local Linux user group. And a little bit more than that, um, essentially, the Fralook is one of the bigger Linux user groups in Germany. It's located in Frankfurt. And um, I'm also an Arch package maintainer, if I have the time. And other hobbies include anything around the software development lifecycle, IT security, and other forms of like Arch, which I really enjoy both on the forensic as well as kind of offsec um, uh, site. And if there's still time left, I'm a community liaison and solution architect for a company called Redis Labs, which is essentially um, the home of Redis, but more about this in a minute. And if there's still some time left, I'll also do a podcast, and apologies about the typo, the URL is really Linux in-laws without the hyphen.eu. And this is a podcast that I've been running with a guy called Martin Visser for the last one and a half years. It's a podcast about um, open source topics, anything goes, software, uh, the ecosystem, and of course, the whole uh, shenanigans around this. Uh, I would like to dedicate this talk to uh, my son, Luca, and of course, the CTO team at a company called Redis Labs, because they are in charge of the innovation that also drives the majority of the modules that surround Redis. But first of all, um, let's see what, I, uh, what I'm going to present in the next 45 minutes-ish. I'm going to give a short overview of what Redis really is. I'm going to go through the multi-model at database aspects because Redis is just not a straightforward NoSQL database, but rather extensible. Um, so you can add different application-specific aspects on top of Redis. Uh, a special module is called Redis Gears that allows the shipping, among other things, the shipping of Python code to the server side, but more on this later. And if there's still time left, I'm going to show this using a demonstration in the area of real-time prediction 
at machine learning, and then it's straight to the wrap up and the question and answers. So let's start with Redis. What is Redis? About 10 years ago, max at 11 actually, uh, a guy called Salvatore Sanfilippo of, of Italian origin had the requirement for a large web reporting project that he kind of was thinking at the time to come up with an ultra performant database that was able to provide real time semantics in terms of um, not exhibiting the latency, the delays that typical database systems bring with them, because one feature that they pretty much shared at the time and still do to some extent today is actually they store memory, uh, they store data on, on persistent um, storage like disks. Although things have improved since then with regards to disk access times, the uh, difference is still visible between um, between uh, storing data on disk and just storing in uh, and data just storing in, in in main memory, and that's precisely the aim of Redis. Rather than storing data on disk, the main processing of data is is actually done in um, in memory, and hence this term in in memory open source database, because the idea is to have the focus of the, on the processing of data in memory, meaning that yes, you can have persistence as an option in your race instance, but at the end of the day. Um, the data is stored in main memory, which brings ultra fast access times in addition to kind of high performance as in high throughput and low latency when you access your, your data. Um, Salvatore looked at other technologies like how to speed up Postgres, how to speed up MySQL, also looked at something called Memcached, which was a, a key value store at the time, but given the fact that the um, that the functionality offered by especially Memcached wasn't sufficient for his purposes, he basically decided to sit down and write his own implementation of a, an in-memory NoSQL database. So some numbers. Redis is probably the database with the most client-side implementations, meaning you get about 100 uh, about 164 clients in 48 languages, um, almost 50 now. Um, the slide, the, the slide is, is a little bit older. The thing is basically that with any program language and anything goes here, ranging from the more popular program languages like Python, Java, C Sharp, C++, and all the rest of them, right up to more esoteric ones like, I'm almost tempted to say Rust, Haskell, or, or, Ema, or, Lips, or Lisp, chances are that there is at least one, if not more, client-side implementations, as in library implementations for that language. For example, Python alone has about four of them. Uh, same goes for Java. So depending on the requirements, because most, uh, because all of these clients and implementations offer different functionality in terms of what they what they offer um, with regards to features and functions. Um, also, they kind of the the API comprehensiveness and that sort of thing. So the idea is basically that with most of the languages, you can pick and choose. Um, of your um, the 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 clients that have that that most that most that that fits your needs ideally. Let's put it this way, because Redis is an open source project. The server code base is licensed under three uh, under a three clause BSD license. You have an active community, so we have more than eleven thousand commits these days, nearly totaling uh, twelve thousand, with more than uh, with almost 500 contributors contributing to the code base. One of them is actually talking to you right now because after I joined Redis Labs a couple of years back, I started to extend the standard Python client with streams functionality. Streams are essentially an in-memory message bus, if you will, in functionality somewhat comparable to, to other approaches like, like Kafka, for example. Um, the project has about 50,000 GitHub stars. That gives you a little bit of an impression of how popular the code base has grown over the last uh, few years. In addition to the client-side implementations, you have more than 100 higher-level libraries and tools using these client-side implementations. Again, Another indication of how popular 
the code base has grown with the community because it's not just Salvatore Sanfilippo contributing to the project. Um, as a matter of fact, he gave, he transferred the stewardship to a steering committee as of last year. Um, now there's a um, there's a couple of people instead him running the project, but the community is quite large, and this is actually one of the benefits of Redis because you get contributors from all walks of life, and hence the innovation that comes from this diversity, if you will, is quite comprehensive because the more people you add to an open source project coming from different backgrounds, having different kind of requirements on the code base and all the rest of it, the more um, food for thought these people can provide goes without saying. This is also reflected in the 60K Stack Overflow questions. Speaking of Stack Overflow, um, Redis has been ranked the most loved database on this particular platform, the most loved NoSQL database, I'm tempted to add, uh, on this platform for the last, um, I think, four years in a row. Uh, again, that gives you some, some uh, impression of, of what we're looking at. Funny enough, after I joined Redis Labs, and this is what I sort of still do once a year or something like that, I used the GitHub API to extract project requirements and this is basically when I take a look at the output of this data, I see Redis being used in antivirus scanners, mail systems, uh, just to name a few use cases, mostly in the area of caching because that's exactly where Redis comes from because this is a hard, most of the time, a hard real-time requirement. Um, taking a further look at the Redis ecosystem. Um, just to kind of give you some overview, the Redis data structures are depicted on the left-hand side of the slide. Um, for those of you who haven't been exposed to Redis, or just this is just a short overview. So the data structures range from simple strings, as in, key, well, the notion of a key value store where, where, where Redis originally came from, but over the years have developed into, into quite a comprehensive and powerful set of supported data structures. For example, Redis also supports bitmaps and bit fields. It supports hashes. Hashes are a set of structures stored under a given key name. It supports lists comparable to the lists you have in Python or, or, or Java to name just two, two programming languages. You also have the support for sets and sorted sets. The difference being set as we know it from Math 101 is just a collection of items without duplicates. But the sorted set is a little bit different because the sorted set actually um, contains a score for each and every item that gives a natural ordering of these items in the set. That means the implementation of recommendation engines or leaderboards that typically carries uh, that typically carry some sort of sequence is easy with that with a particular data type. Geospatial also reflects the um, the x y as in longitude uh, longitude and latitude. Um, uh, data, uh, data types with regards to storing uh, geographical indexes, let's put it this way. So typical use case, you are in Cologne, as in city center, right next to the dome, and want to know um, how many drugstores there are in a five mile radius. It's a, essentially, you then basically take a look at the map, you have the um, locations of the drug stores surrounding in this instance, and then you simply ask Redis, now give me all these points in a five mile radius, and then Redis gives you back the exact locations. Hyperlog log is an example for a probabilistic data structure. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the concept, the idea is to store values, or not the exact, uh, not, not the payload of a value, but rather the um, the representation of the value in memory rather than the value itself. That may sound a little bit different uh, um, strange at first sight, but the idea is essentially, especially if you have large data sets, to only store, and this is how they all work, these probabilistic data structures, to, to just store the hashes in, um, in main memory instead of the items themselves. That means that you get a, prob a, um, a probable result of an operation on, on, a, on a probabilistic data structure. Whereas if you would store the exact item in memory, of course, you would have the probability equal one. Um, 
the lower probability results of a potential hash collision between the hashes for different items. In some rare, um, in some rare cases, um, the items, different items use the same hash value. And this is also known as a hash collision. So typical examples for hyperlock, uh, for, for, for um, probabilistic structures are hyperlock lock and something called bloom filters or cuckoo filters. Um, one of them is implemented as a native data structure, namely hyperlock lock, which essentially gives you the, the number of elements in a given set without having to store the elements themselves in memory. Comes in handy, for example, if you're looking at content distribution networks, if they just want to do a quick check, um, if something is in the local cache or not, they, they basically take a, can take a look at the hash representation. A similar bloom filters actually um, give you the um, a similar probabilistic data structure. Um, Streams, essentially, as I already mentioned, uh, give you a performant, uh, memory, a, a performant memory queue in terms of a queuing system that essentially stores all its values in main memory rather, rather than on disk, like things like Kafka, for example, would do. Um, in addition to these native data, Redis data structures, you have so-called Redis modules. The difference being that these Redis modules are extensions of the native server side. Sometimes the data structures as depicted on the left-hand side of the slide do not satisfy application requirements, meaning that, um, for example, you want to do a graph algorithm um, if you would just use the data structures on the on the on the on the left hand side, you would have to simulate a graph using these native data structures. As you can imagine, this can be cumbersome because you have to do it on the client side. That means additional code and, of course, more round trips to the to the server side because essentially you have to emulate the graph using the native natively available data structures. In addition to this, these Redis modules implement more application-specific data types. Just to name a few of them, I'm going to showcase two of 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 the of the modules on 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 later slides. Um, just let's let's go through them kind of quickly. Um, the idea behind this is, for example, if you want to do a graph algorithm, um, rather than do, emulating this on the client side, you simply load the pre-compiled Redis graph module onto the database, and then you have an open Cypher compliant graph database at your disposal. So similar to Neo4j and other open server compatible databases, you basically take these, um, take these data structures and model your graph like you would do with an ordinary graph database like Neo4j, TigerGraph, Arango, and all the rest of them. The difference between these native for want of a better expression, graph databases in Redis uh, with the module loaded is quite straightforward. With the modules, you actually get the benefits of native Redis right out of the box. So in, com in, in contrast to other graph databases, the graphs are still processed in main memory, again, yielding ultra low latency and ultra high performance in terms of throughput. So let's go through these modules a little bit in, in a little bit more detail. JSON essentially is a document database extension, that is, as a module. In functionality comparable to, say, MongoDB or Couchbase, search is a full text search engine, somewhat comparable to other popular open source systems like Elasticsearch. Time series and AI, I will go into a little bit more detail later on. And gears I've already kind of touched upon. Now, commercial break, I'm working for a company called Redis Labs. So we, the Redis Labs, and I would like to keep this commercial break to an absolute minimum, um, offers, does, does offer a, an enterprise version of the software. Redis Labs is an open core company um, that offers a set of additional features depicted in the lower third of the slide. Um, like security features, 
um, extended uh, persistence, uh, like a tiered memory approach, but I won't go in through in, into the details because, as I said, this is not a uh, presentation about Redis Enterprise, but rather Redis itself. If you're interested in the features, just check out um, redislabs.com. So with that, actually, we are already uh, entering the multi-model database aspects. So how are the modules architected in principle? You have the server side, as I kind of already explained, where um, you would have the different modules loaded, in, sorry, into your database, like, J, like, like Redis JSON, like Redis Time Series and Redis Gears. And then essentially um, you would have then on the client side, you would have a tiered or a layered approach to application functionality that an application can use in order to avail of the functionality contained on the server side. At the very bottom, you have something, uh, a kind of very minimal layer called high Redis. High Redis essentially is only a wrapper around certain operating system provided functionality like sockets because you are communicating with the server-side IRV via TCP sockets or Unix domain sockets, should you be on the same machine as the server-side, which of course has certain benefits in terms of performance because essentially you're circumventing the full TCP stack and are just basically are using memory buffers between the client and the server-side implementation. Um, also, High Redis implement, implements a simple um, memory allocator for um, um, yeah um, for memory management on the on, on the on, on the on the client side. Language specific bindings essentially tie High Redis to a particular programming language. Every programming language is different. For example, you have programming languages like Python, like Java. Um, where garbage collection is part of the language definition. Uh, in contrast to this, you have programming language like C or C++ um, or Rust, which is something in between when it comes down to memory management that do not uh, manage memory for you. This is the reason why um, there, and, and of course the semantics between, between different programming languages are also kind of different. Um, this is the reason why the language specific binding layer abstracts away these differences, so to the server side, um, it basically all looks the same. Uh, among other things, what the language-specific bindings do is they um, take the language-specific API calls and wrap them into a wire protocol, which is called RESP in this case, um, that contain the payload and the metadata in terms of what, it, what the, uh, the, the exact command that should be invoked on the server side. On top of the language specific bindings, you have module specific bindings that abstract away um, the, uh, the particular implementation of the module on the client side. So each and every module has a set of standard um, client side implementations. For example, most modules would implement at least Java and Python as a standard library, but um, the implementations are extending, are, are being extended all the time. So chances are that uh, if you are looking, for example, for a Haskell or a, a Rust API um, for your for, for your favorite module, chances are there is a there's a there, there's a corresponding there's a corresponding module specific binding already out there in the ecosystem. Based on the particular application requirement and an application is free to choose the specific level uh, that it uses to access the server side of course it can rely on the language specific bindings thus kind of emulating module functionality itself um, as we will see shortly each and every module is represented by a set of a set of specific commands that is used to invoke its functionality typically beginning with a prefix um, but as I said, if there is a client side implementation available for the module, a module actually can also use this. Um, it depends really on what the module needs, uh, what, sorry, what the application needs in terms of the abstraction layer or the abstraction level, how it wants to access Redis. On with the next slide. Two modules example, uh, two, two examples for modules, time series displayed on this particular slide and Redis AI 
which I'm going to go into a minute. Redis time series is in functionality comparable to something called InfluxDB or other time series databases as they do exist in the open source and closed source domain. So um, each and every, oh, sorry, I, I should probably explain what a time series is. A time series is essentially a stream of data that has a timestamp attached to it. Typical use cases as shown on the slide would, for example, include any Internet of Thing things um, or monitoring or filtering of data. Imagine your typical power plant. A power plant typically has a reactor, if it's a nuclear power plant or, so, or some sort of energy uh, or some sort of um, gadget that takes fuel of some sort um, and transforms this, in, and, and transform this into power. So typically a power plant has a turbine. Um, but also a power plant typically has a, a transformer and all the rest of this, uh, th th these gadgets. So all of these components would have sensors attached to them that measure their particular state of maintenance, their operating parameters like temperature, pressure in terms of a, in terms of a turbine, all the rest of it. Um, and because you want to know what's going on at a particular point in time, typically these sensors would also in addition to the data, a time series database would also capture the point in time when a sensor measurement would be taken, uh, meaning that you um, have not only the data itself, but also the time when this data was being recorded, which is important uh, because that allows you, for example, to spot trends. If um, the temperature of a turbine is increasing steadily over a certain amount of time, it's almost certain that there's something wrong with the turbine because if that wasn't the case, uh, the, cooling uh, the cooling system would be doing its job, but if the temperature is, is increasing, that there's something wrong with the cooling system around the temperature. It's that sort of thing that allows you to actually spot or identify trends and becomes vital if you're looking at monitoring mission-critical systems. Um, some capabilities of the modules, uh, of this particular module, for example, and this is not really different from any other time series database. It allows downsampling or compaction of data it allows you to further index time series data. And of course, you can query the whole thing. But if you are, for, are, just, uh, are just interested in a, in a summary of the data over time, you would typically use something called aggregation, like averaging, um, identifying the standard deviation of particular samples and all the rest of it. Um, Important, as I said, if you want to kind of take a look at the at the snapshot uh, at, at the development of time series data over time, it also um, supports compression, for example, delta and double data encoding, and of course, it's integrated already with um, something called Grafana and Prometheus. Typically, standard components these days that actually give you a nice, not only graphical representation of time series data, but also allow you to further um, provide functionality like drilling down on time series data and all the rest of it. Um, and as I already kind of touched upon, use cases include monitoring, filtering, anything regarding to IoT, because this is uh, probably the most used use case these days for time series data. Uh, next uh, module is actually something called Redis AI. Redis AI, of course, standing for Redis and Artificial Intelligence. Um, it's the answer, let's put it this way, to current challenges in the deep learning or machine learning area today. Because if you take a look at typical um, implementations of backpropagation networks like the likes of TensorFlow, the likes of Torch, and all the rest of it, they have one particular challenge, i.e. they, um, even between their kind of different layers, and backpropagation networks typically consist of layers of simulated neurons. That's the way these things work in terms of um, the actual implementation of, deep, of a deep learning algorithm. Um, these... Uh, these um, approaches to backpropagation networks typically have to rely on persistent data, um, as in data stored on disk, even for the intra-layer uh, computations. So 
the way back progression networks works is essentially you have a set of input neurons and then you have a set of so-called hidden neurons and then you have a set of output neurons. So essentially between these layers, depending on the particular implementation, the data is, some, is sometimes persisted to disk. Um, also, if you um, are gathering data on an input layer, um, more often than not, actually you have to go to a disk in order to get that to get that data. Same goes on the on the output side, um, and of course, it all takes time. So the idea, as depicted on the slide, is actually to take the data to the model. So what Redis AI really is, it is actually a combination of a neural network and Redis right, uh, right uh, compacted into a, a single address space. So the idea is to you, you, you load a module and that module has an, has an embedded TensorFlow instance, has an embedded PyTorch instance uh, or, or an embedded ONNX instance. And these are the supported backends for, for Redis AI. And in contrast to other approaches, the data is already stored in the Redis instance. So the, um, the module doesn't have to go to disk in order to get the data, but it just queries the contents of the local Redis instance sitting pretty close to it. That's, that's the overall idea. And hence these two new Redis data types, the tensor and the model. Um, a tensor hence TensorFlow, is actually a representation of data and the model is your backpropagation network, i.e. TensorFlow, um, uh, a, tensor, a TensorFlow, a PyTorch, or an ONX model. Um, the use cases are straightforward. Anything where real time is required in the area of deep learning is the sweet spot. So essentially what Redis AI is, is a real-time stack, real stack for deep learning and machine learning applications. Um, so this is basically the, the overall approach to combine, as I kind of already alluded to, to combine a, a, a backpropagation network engine or implementation rather, and Redis all into one kind of a server-side implementation. But now on to Redis Gears. What is Redis Gears? Redis Gears, um, essentially it's a serverless engine, meaning uh, you have a component running, in, uh, running inside Redis that allows you to um, do certain operations. Um, and we're gonna go into the, in, into the details in a, in a moment, but essentially it's an ecosystem that allows you to map data, to filter data, to aggregate data, but also, and this is the important bit, um, to ship that data off to a, cl to, to a business logic implementation. What this is, I'm gonna go into, into on the next slide, but, at, but suffice it to say for the time being, essentially Gears allows you to take business logic from the client side, ship it to the server side, and have it executed in the server context. So in contrast to other approaches where you would typically uh, have multiple round trips between the client and the server side, for example, um, a business logic implementation on the on the application side would first of all query data, would then process that data on the, on the client side, and ultimately ship this back uh, the so processed data to the server side in order to have it stored. In, a, in contrast to this, Redis Gears ships the application or, let, or lets the application ship a certain amount of business logic to the server side. No more round trips because the business logic is then executed as part of the as part of the server context. Um, as a result, you have a dynamic framework for data flow implementations because that's exactly what it is. Um, as we will see in a moment, essentially the idea is you define a data flow and then Redis takes care of implementing this on, on the server side. Um, and of course, Redis Gears also provides an abstraction layer for data, for data distribution, uh, clustering and deployment because of course you can use Redis gears in the cluster of nodes, meaning you, that you can distribute business logic across different cluster nodes. Um, for those of you who know map, map and reduce coming from a company called Google, very, very similar. So the idea, and that's exactly how Redis, how Redis gears works actually internally, um, 
you ship the application code to the server side, you ship, uh, you, you, the data is already kind of in the cluster. The, then Redis Gears takes care of distributing that business logic across the cluster nodes, let it execute on, the, on a particular node, and then gathers the results back onto, onto a single server instance, ready for shipping back um, um, either to, uh, sorry, first of all, of course, storing it to the data in, 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 on, onto the, in, into the Redis instance, and then ultimately shipping the result back to the, uh, to the client side implementation, as in the application itself. So in a nutshell, it's actually a pretty sophisticated um, approach to a data flow implementation on the, on the server side. Let's see how this is implemented, actually, as in the principal architecture. I uh, kind of already touched upon cluster management. Um, there is, of course, an execution management that comes into play um, in terms of the cluster management takes care of the more infrastructure-oriented aspects, like how many nodes there are in the cluster, how these nodes can be reached, and the, and the execution management actually um, takes the business logic, um, schedules the whole thing across the cluster, and then um, uh, manages the execution of, of this workload. And I kind of already touched upon map and map and reuse. Uh, these three components work in, I'm almost, I'm almost tempted to say in tandem, but in close cooperation, because that's exactly what this Redis gear core makes up. Um, this at the moment is abstracted away by a C API. Um, and that's exactly where Python comes into play. At the moment, um, the Redis gear the Redis Gears implementation has an embedded um, Python instance, meaning if you if you take the code from GitHub, you compile it, uh, and and as part of this uh, module compilation, a um, Python uh, sorry a C Python instance is actually compiled into the module. Um, C Python uses the C based API towards kind of uh, in terms of language bindings and so forth um, to talk to the Redis core. Um, other, op other languages providing a similar um, binding mechanism are already kind of planned. So watch this space. Um, the next language that is probably being released is going to be Java because similar to python once you once you support a c api essentially you can talk to redis gear core so how does it work let's just let's take a look at a typical code snippet um so the top half of this slide is actually the the code that you would ship to the server side and that's exactly displayed in the in the middle of this slide. So um, the gear is the Python snippet at the very top. You essentially ship this to the server side. Redis minus CLI is the command line interface of Redis. Uh, the uh, command is called rg for Redis gears.execute. And minus x means take your standard input and append it to whatever I tell next. So essentially, what this means is you say you tell the server here's the command redis gears execute um and here's the gears or here's the gear implementation as depicted in the top half of the of the of the slide and then execute this actually on the server side and that's exactly what you see on the very bottom of the slide as in, in as in the lower half of it so set foo test these are redis native commands um essentially set a key value to something called test this. So this is a typical string operation. And the, and the key foo1 is set to this is a test. What this gear depicted on the slide actually does, it um, first of all, it extracts the values from the keys. And this is exactly the, the gb.map invocation. The gears builder just creates a gear on, on, on the server side. So gb.map um, essentially takes the contents of the database. Um, so in that case, that would be foo and foo uh, and foo one, and basically extract the values. Then gb.flatmap would take these records and split them based on spaces, meaning you get, for example, for the strings this is a test, you would get the sub records this is a test. So essentially, flatmap takes a record and produces four. Um, for sub records based on the split. 
And GB count by is then an aggregation function that simply counts the number of occurrences of a key in or of a key value rather in the database. So if you then subsequently say that, say that GB dot run, what this does is essentially it takes all of the keys as in foo and foo one, uh, splits them up, splits these strings up based on spaces, and then um, counts the word occurrences. And that's exactly what you see in the result set displayed at the bottom of the slide. So the test key is 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 is, is, um, is counted twice because foo consists of tests and foo one consists and and foo one has a test in it, and then all of the other substrings are, are just have one occurrence because um, there's only one this, there's only one is, there's only one a. So this is a kind of poor man's um, word counting um, algorithm implemented by a gear at the very top. Um, the And this gives you some impression of how easy it is actually to, to implement the gear in Python. So um, as I kind of already kind of, uh, kind of alluded to, the way you do it, you basically give it the string, the string is then shipped as a, as a gear to the server side, and then it's executed, and then the result ship, and then the result set is shipped back. Simple as that. So now for the demo, oh, I still have some time left, okay. Um, so quickly, let's go through this. Essentially, it's a time, it's a time series data prediction approach, or demonstration rather. The idea is to read via a time series database typical weather metrics like humidity, temperature, and wind speed. Then using a gear, feed this into a pre-trained model because at the end of the day, Redis AI is mostly focusing on, in, on inference of data. So it requires an already kind of trade model for the backpropagation network. And then again, part of this gear um, uh, takes this predicted time series data because this is what the um, what the model is all about basically it takes it takes um, a couple of time series values as uh, contained in the time series database and based on the training it tries to predict um, future um, future values so what you typically do is and the overall inspiration for this model actually comes from Comes from TensorFlow. Or comes from the TensorFlow core documentation, but it's actually where the where this very kind of thing is kind of uh, used as a as a as a demo for for TensorFlow. So the idea is basically is uh, you take a couple of of time series data and uh, data items, and based on this time uh, on, on this sample, essentially you predict the um the or you forecast the weather rather rather on on a on a on a on a, on a period basis. And that's exactly what um, what this thing does. Basically, it takes a um, a history of say a couple of hours of the last readings, and based on this history, it predicts in a single step the next values um, for temperature, humidity, and wind speed. Um, finally, this is wrapped into an HTML um, web page and then displayed on any web browser connecting to the server. And let me show this. And this is what it should look like. This is actually the weather prediction demo. Um, it should auto refresh apparently. It's no, it still does. So essentially this is the time step over a series of time, over a series of times. Um, the history is displayed as a uh, blue graph. The true future, because I'm using a simulated set, or I'm using a pre-recorded set of of values. Unfortunately, um, I didn't find uh, in the shortness of time I didn't find real life sensor um, that was able to deliver me value. So this is a simulation of a time series database. Um, the idea is essentially that the history displays the 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 history as in the run up um, to the to the uh, point in time so far. Uh, the model prediction is indicated as a green spot. And the true future is actually indicated by, by a red X, uh, meaning you have a nice indication of the deviation between the predicted model and the true future based on the on the on the on the recorded history on the recorded history of the time series. Going back to my no. Further reading. Um, you find the documentation for Redis on something called Redis.io. 
you find the Gears documentation on Redis Gears.io. Redis AI is funny enough documented on redisai.io. And when I say documented, there's a quick start that typically um, uh, tells you how to instantiate the module in a Docker container to pack together with a with a with the Redis instance, um, but also typically contains instructions how to compile a module. As I said, the I didn't invent the time for time time series forecasting demo. Um, the uh, basis for this you can actually find as part of the TensorFlow um, um, tutorials. Uh, funny enough, in a section called Time Series. And of course, another kind of very short commercial break. Uh, there's a Redis Labs University powered by Redis Labs that allows you to know more about Redis free of charge. Simply go to the site, register using your email address, um, then essentially uh, get, a, get a registration confirmation, select a couple of courses, pass these courses as in kind of enroll in these courses, pass the final test, and you get a certificate. If you then post the certificate on LinkedIn, we send you a t-shirt. End of commercial break. Any questions are more than how happy to answer. Let's go back to the to the chat. Um, so, so right yeah, uh, right on time. So unfortunately, yes. we don't have time for questions then. Uh, because, oh, we don't. Yeah, the slot is then two forty-five. Then uh, it's yes. lunch break. Uh, but you know, uh, people if they're interested, they can of course uh, ask questions in the chat. Uh, even the bigger room is free to use. So um, I'm sure so, that people would be happy to uh, have you. some interaction there. Yes, right. more than happy. I'm, I'm another. I'm, I'm available for another fifteen minutes in the breakout room associated with the session. Looking forward to seeing you there, and thank you for participation. Yeah, thank you. Bye.